So hello everyone, I'm Daniel, one of the instigators of RDAO. We are a research and development DAO uh, focused on innovation in DAO governance and operations. And today I'm very happy to have Tim Stuck with us, who's an expert in culture mapping. He's the co-founder of Scenario DNA. That's a research consultancy that advises multiple global clients on how to leverage cultural trends. And he's also an associate teaching professor at the Parsons New School of Design, where he teaches about trend analysis and design strategy. So today we're going to be talking about uh, culture mapping. And team, please over to you if you'd like to share a little bit more about your background. Uh, that'd be most appreciated. And we're very excited to hear your presentation. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's great to be here. I, I yes, I will. Um, I will. Uh, review a little bit of what you just said, just to put it into context, is that I split my time between a consulting practice um, called Scenario DNA, um, which has been uh, centered around developing a utility patent uh, uh, on culture mapping um, over the last over, uh, I would say, almost 20 years, um, which is centered around uh, analyzing language uh, signal towards cultural change. Um, we work with uh, data scientists, but especially working with computational linguists in measuring language, but then using a narrative approach to being able to understand how these um, how these single signals actually amass into stories that can be patterned and studied over time. Um, and then my other side is working uh, teaching uh, uh, trend analysis, which is really placing it into the into context for students over the last 17 plus years at Parsons. Um, how do you use these methods most practically? I mean, working uh, in teaching this, it's very much in the context uh, at Parsons in terms of design thinking. And we've seen the evolution of design thinking, I would say, through um, a recession and through and, and, and now through a pandemic and you know uh, the volatility of the world is is very much sort of um, fo a focus of how I teach students to sort of look at trends. Um, the clients that we work with just very simply is just sort of like the, it's it's to understand. I mean, we think about uh, research in terms of answering kind of tough questions. They're not typical questions. They're not. Uh, they become potentially marketing questions, but we push pull people away from sort of thinking in a marketing way and thinking much more in a human way. We spend a lot of time with clients um, sort of in the commercial world, um, thinking beyond their category, especially um, what role do they play in society and understanding kind of how those narratives are playing out to how what they do needs to change and how they may need to make investments in different ways. Um, recognizing that change is inevitable and volatility is inevitable inevitable how do you develop a research method that can really sort of withstand sort of a more ambiguous world um my work becomes easier in talking to clients when you have things like pandemics because you know it sort of becomes obvious um it, it it's less obvious when things don't appear to be changing as much but i would say we live at a time where i think more people are aware more clients are aware of the fact that you need to understand these kind of methods towards change. Um, the core of what we do, um, around, I had mentioned before about language, but it's really looking at language in terms of how it relates to how culture kind of emerges. And so we spend a lot of time studying subcultures. Um, we see these as kind of these engines of social cohesion. Um, they allow you to be able to read signals before they become more mainstream. A lot of trend analysis looks at the surface as, as uh, once things become kind of ob obvious and they're manifested as social behaviors. But how do you look at those, those signals much earlier? You look for subcultures that are actually responding. Subcultures are, we look at the idea of subcultures as part of a power system, essentially. So concepts of like, what is dissenting in culture is very important to understanding, uh, understanding change. So subcultures are very key to how we look at uh, that change. And then as I had mentioned to you before, it's like understanding change in this world of recession, pandemic, what is now what we call a perma crisis, which is sort of, I think, eventually we've reached this point where we've accepted that, oh, the world is constantly changing. Um, one of the interesting things, if you study these trends through these different moments of change, like the recession, it's um, 
and you, you're sort of talking to people about their expectation of, oh, well, we'll return back to what we were doing before. We go through a recession and then people sort of will go back to what they were before. There's this sort of linear idea of how, how sort of change happens and how culture changes is that when you look at um, sort of it in in a more sort of underneath the surface, this sort of social science kind of approach is that you're seeing the fact that these aren't linear processes. The, the, the culture is changing constantly. You know, culture is, is a biological system, uh, really. And if we're going through that process of adapting to these changes, we need to understand how those, how those signals, how those behaviors, traits, and so forth are changing in the context of those ongoing externalities. So that's sort of the state of research is, you know, and I, you know, I teach trend analysis at a school that talks a lot about design research. So, you know, I end up sort of being kind of a sort of a pushing against sort of sort of the, uh, you know, sort of the standard of design strategy as sort of your your typical idea of design strategy as being some somewhat um, uh, inadequate, I would say, in terms of the kind of world that we live in today. I mean, you look at sort of the basics of design strategy is that we sort of look at, well, what what do, what do people desire? Um, what tools do we have? What's, you know, what is the sort of feasibility of the tools that we have? And then sort of viability, can we sort of make money on it? That's not really how design works. Um, and you start looking at kind of basing a lot of what you do on materials and sort of what methods you have. It's a very engineering, it comes very much from our Bauhaus sort of traditions, is that we base a lot on that sort of materiality and not looking under the surface of what is really essentially the, it's the essential component of UX, which is behavior. And is, you know, when you look at sort of a phone, um, the use of a phone is, is, is really about the changing and adapting meaning of privacy with that technology that's been adapted. But it's not included within that process and it's not within typical kinds of foresight frameworks because they think very linearly based upon existing tools we have and that it will continue along a particular track. I mean, we have that a lot in terms of how we look at autonomous cars or any pick any kind of sort of future kind of trend subject, and we make a lot of biased kinds of conclusions about what will actually happen in the future, and you're not looking at the volatility of social behavior. You're not looking at about the design within that context. So more importantly, we need to think in terms of a much more of a pattern of, of um, a social science sort of way of patterning this information between knowns and unknowns, and you could say kind of residual this residual traits that we have and what are emergent traits that are uh, are showing up in response to what is not working. These are narrative par patterns that happen uh, that are happening within culture all the time based upon the things that we make and the systems that we put out in the world. So to look at, you know, a, a, you know, a, a much stronger approach to research is taking this narrative um, approach, you know, our world is shaped by stories. Um, you know, they are, we define, um, you know, the, this image here is uh, the fall of Icarus. I would say that we are definitely in a fall of Icarus moment. Uh, there is, I mean, I look at for particularly as an archetype, a cultural archetype, Elon Musk as a cultural arch archetype, um, you know, represents a lot of other kinds of expectations we had as to how technology was solving problems in our world. And it's kind of interesting the ways in which those things are sort of falling apart and study them as narratives and the subculture responses to that sort of crumbling. And you get a very interesting kind of picture, a much clearer picture of actually what is going to happen into the future. Um, you know, uh, so the idea of looking at the world in terms of residual narratives and emerging narratives, those patterns are really kind of the essential, the essential structure that we tend to look at. The, the way human beings learn about their world is through stories. We are narrative-based 
you know, intelligent creatures. And the tradition of oral storytelling gives us kind of a window into kind of how we learn about the world around us. So, you know, the, the job of an oral storyteller back, you know, before the time of printed, printed books and so forth was to go to town to town and tell these stories, a set of stories that they had. And as they told those stories, those stories did not remain static. They changed because they changed in the context, because they were being received and they were being contextualized to be used to solve particular contextual design issues, social issues that were happening within within that particular village. So those those narratives are constantly changing and those become, you know, they become a uh, an algorithm, you could say, of this idea of, of, of cultural change. We're using those stories to learn about the world around us. Children, when they acquire language, don't learn specific words. They learn through the context of those words within emotional narratives, right? And so our way in which we learn about story is very critical to understanding how trends and how culture changes. Joseph Campbell put this into a, some would say, an oversimplified model of like of narratology. Um, the hero's journey is a very useful tool in some ways because it allows us to understand that there are the there are there is a basic structure to how um, to, uh, to how these stories are are told how they're how, how they're written. If you want to go down a very interesting rabbit hole, I will say look at the debate between academic folklorists and Joseph Campbell because he's he's actually very much reviled in a lot of the academic sort of folklore world because it, it oversimplifies to some degree some of the work that they do. But it doesn't, it, it, what it does do is it makes us understand what the basics are of narrative, which is there begins with the fact that there is a broke, you know, things become established culturally. And we go into, you know, in the ordinary world in, in the, and that narrative at some points becomes broken. So we establish rules, we establish regulations, we do all, we, our policies are that idea of story becoming static and being made static. But that point is that we don't, it, it, there is a point of which that that becomes broken because it doesn't meet as, as society is changing. So there is this issue of needing to resolve that story. So there's this pattern of dissent that happens culturally as this cycle of constant change. We've gone through those cycles, as I had mentioned earlier, with the recession. I mean, the recession didn't live as just this economic event. It was tied to very many social movements like Occupy, which ended up feeding a lot of other protest movements that are brought about different aspects of social awareness. I mean, the birth of, of the recession brought about the birth of Etsy as a company. And you look at like frameworks of how we look at how people think about the products that they own is changed through a process in many other ways than you can imagine. So when you're looking at this, this, this narrative structure, you're trying to, trying to understand the idea of a cycle of, uh, of change. So automation is a story system. You know, the, you know, this relationship between the ordinary world of things becoming automated mechanical Turk and so forth, there is an inevitability, I would say, especially during the pandemic, of mechanization automation. It be, but there is underneath the surface, um, there, is, there is a lot of dissent. There is uh, everything from you know, the great resignation to quiet quitting and all these other traits of behavior. Um, the future of labor and understanding the future of work depends on understanding these particular patterns. Um, it isn't automation doesn't fix the problem. It actually creates other problems. So you need to understand that narrative pattern to understand the full system and how it's particularly changing. Another one that is, you know, very much sort of in the, you know, common sort of sort of in our headspace right now is, you know, the metaverse as a, as a, as a story space. And I mean, the metaverse didn't, ex you know, didn't emerge. Um, uh, you know, it, as it recently has been discussed, it, it it has been emerging back since the birth of what was the subcultures of cyberpunk. Um, and the evolution of cyberpunk to cypherpunk to cryptopunk 
gives you a very interesting window into what has become the commercialization of immersive worlds and, and also gives you a window into what is the emergence of a new dystopic idea of what these immersive worlds can actually be. You see a lot of like, um, you know, uh, what is being commercialized as the metaverse right now is really borrowed from things. It's residual language. It's not emerging language. These aren't new trends. They're just using things that we've already, we, we already have. Our imagination is much more in understanding the unease of the relationship between physical and virtual worlds right now. Um, it's not about immersive worlds. It's about hybridized worlds. Um, which is causing a lot of um, social anxiety. So the source to understand where to, where you know where you where you see the best picture of where this future is going is within those subcultures that are responding to this right now. I mean, there's sort of a uh, you know an evolution of cryptopunk, and there's a resurgence and almost a nostalgia for cyberpunk right now. and it has a lot to do with these themes, these narrative themes re-emerging in culture and playing a much more sort of mundane role in our lives. Language sits at, as the index of cultural change. So when you're looking at trying to understand how these narratives take, take shape, you look for the signifiers. Those, you know, it, this is applied semiotics in its most basic sense. You're saying, you know, and I point here to, a, you know, a very raw sort of blunt instrument of search terms emerging, but understanding kind of the rise and fall of language in context is really what tells you what's particularly changing. Um, people begin to use language in ways that if you were to ask them why they were using it, they wouldn't know. It's more tied to something that they're processing that they can't completely articulate. So these signifiers, if you understand how to measure them correctly and place them into taxonomies and, uh, and, 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 uh, and clusters to sort of pattern effectively, you start being able to see kind of these narrative patterns from this language that give you a better indication of how culture is changing. Um, it's a system. I mean, culture is a system. Um, culture takes shape through traits, behaviors. It's the signifiers that that shape these subcultures. You know, it, there isn't one idea of culture. Culture is all many different subcultures that define what is happening and how we're trying to process the world around us. So if you look at culture as a system, what you're really saying, I mean, uh, what you're really saying is, is that it's, you know, culture is not monolithic, trends are not monolithic. One of the ways that we began working at the very beginning when I started this company was, you know, moving clients away from the idea of demographic kind of modeling um, uh, back in the 2000s and looking at millennials, because every company was very interested in, you know, cashing in on kind of the size of this demographic and so forth. And, you know, it was trying to get, uh, you know, uh, companies to understand that, you know, they are not a monolithic group what they are are their their patterns within this within within this uh within this age range this people who are born at a certain time that have to do with how different groups are dealing with those externalities you could see within you know as early as say 2007 um what would become now sort of more sort of uh sort of common uh, conversations around concerns about privacy but nobody would ever Nobody would ever, you know, pay attention at that time to realize that we were about, you know, we were about to have an epidemic of loneliness. We were about to have an epidemic of kind of sort of mental health tied to a lot of these technologies. But the signals were already there. They were just, we weren't focused. We were looking too much on the surface. And it's about looking at the system, the whole system of that culture and recognizing for every signal, there is actually, a, a, you know, an opposite signal, actually. So there are these kind of, these, these counter forces that are always at work. And when you look in this kind of applied sort of semiotics, anthropo, uh, uh, sort of a, a applied social science way, you are... You're saying, I can find those, I can classify those, I can measure those. And what you do is you study them over time. You don't make conclusions about them too quickly. What you do is you say, you create a tentative hypothesis about them and you start continuing to gather 
sort of data around um, uh, how they're changing in, in that particular way. So, you know, you know, technology has fueled, um, you know, these story systems in ways that we could never have imagined. I mean, like you go back to kind of a quick history of, you know, from Claude Shannon sort of sort of giving us kind of the theory of of of, you know, uh, modern sort of information kind of uh, sort of sort of technology uh, sort of dissemination to McLuhan, um, you know, uh, where it's about systems, you know, are as much about cultural meaning, you know, the, we build these systems and they actually begin to affect the meaning of the cultures that we actually li live in to Trump, which is essentially McLuhan's prediction, which is, you know, man becomes the sex organs of the machine world. We have a lot of of what appears to be human behaviors, but actually are machine behaviors um, in our world. Um, it makes it, we do some work in the political sphere and it, it's, um, you know, it's become very difficult to sort of uh, manage uh, a sort of, sort of uh, support around certain kinds of causes and ideas because it's so easy to sort of pollute them with other counterpoints that are, you know, there's a lot of meme memes and sort of emotional kinds of ways of it, uh, of expressing, um, you know, uh, ideology that doesn't have to do with actually moving from ideological position to actually policy position. It's just it's all about emotion. It's just about um, and then Trump kind of really represented a, a lot of that. One of the, we did a lot of analysis around um, Trump when before he was elected, and it, what we identified is is the ways in which he was taking fringe subcultures of hate groups and being able to repackage them into kind of basically mainstreaming of hate speech. Um, so and 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 to the point where people could share them easily on Facebook. And not have it appear as though you don't have to have that affiliation, but you're actually sort of, you know, you're participating in that kind of ideological system that has its roots back within those particular hate groups. Um, so it's important to understand the ways in which technology has actually made that much, much more complex. So this is the approach that that uh, that we use in terms of culture mapping as a way of, you know being able to take language into these particular, there are four different meaning spaces here. We There is, you know, the residual and the dominant, which sort of define kind of the main, our, our mainstream culture and the disruptive and the emergent um, that uh, represent more of the, the sort of, what I had said before with the Joseph Joseph Campbell, the special world, the subculture world that is that is um, that is developing. What is important about this particular method is that it's not about looking at these as discrete spaces. They represent each other. They 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 are related to each other. So when we're looking at certain kinds of policies or regulations, you look to in the residual space. You look in terms of um, the disruptive space in that response. So you're looking at protest speech, and you're looking at sort of emit what is sort of more the beginning of kind of abstract sort of architecture of new meaning. Um, and before it actually becomes sort of physical, which is when it moves over into the emergent space, it's turned into a more um, uh, uh, sort of a, it, it's, it's contextualized into sort of the way things could actually be done. You know, I always use as an example, food is sort of the simplest, it's like organic, as an example, you know, was a dissenting subculture to what was the industrialization of food after World War II. It begins as an abstract philosophy in terms of, of um, in terms of a response to industrial industrialized food food methods, but it doesn't become something that people um, engage in until it's turned into a recipe, in turns until it's actually contextualized in a way of actually doing things ongoing, which then it becomes once it's moved from the emergent space up into the dominant space, you go into it's something that people share to show that they are doing things right. It's like in that dominant space, it has a lot to do with us sort of uh, achieving certain social currency. And then from there, it's sort of it, the, that, that part of where it then goes back into the residual space where we say, ah, 
we can make these certain things into policies, we can make these into certain regulations, and we have the support for that. This cycle is ongoing. And, you know, the purpose of looking at the language this way is like we can sort of see this as it changes. It's not to come to any conclusion. It's being able to throw any source of data at this particular method. We don't look, we're completely data agnostic. Um, we, you know, we're just looking at any kind of source of data in every single language. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in Asia and Latin America. Um, and it's understanding kind of uh, how do you pull in sourcing the data in that way to be able to read that most effectively. So, so you know, these particular, as I had said before, these story spaces, it's like in the disruptive space, you know, what new philosophies and frameworks are being proposed has as much to do with what new standards are being, are be, you know, uh, are being made policy. So like, it's almost, well, that isn't enough, you know, that isn't, you know, there's actually, as I had mentioned before about organic, um, you know, organic has been turned into such a premium luxury culturally that it's lost and diluted its meaning is that you see kind of, and it's moved us away from science, actually. It's almost sort of very much sort of created an anti-science men, uh, mentality in society is that there is a reclaiming of science within the disruptive space. It's very interesting to see. And you start seeing kind of a, you know, which becomes kind of the beginning of a new approach to food systems that potentially has the ability to be more sustainable in that regard. Um, so when you're looking at these particular spaces, we're understanding them as related to each other. We use um, Jungian archetypes to, to frame that language um, in these particular archetypes. They are kind of like you know, they're sort of algorithms to those stories, essentially. They're this sort of, they repeat, they repeat, and you start seeing language that associates itself with these particular archetypes. But again, it's it's working towards not becoming um, deductive in this process. It's being able to to use it to see more that you wouldn't be able to see if, um, if it wasn't structured in this way. Um, I'll put it into the context of, you know, for example, if we were to look at, um, you know, the idea of livable cities, you know, as a story system, if I were to look at um, a bike lane as a, you know, what does it tell me about culture? Um, it's a story of a kind of an imperfect um, execution on things that are being demanded culturally over a long period of time, right? It's sort of a best guess at, 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 at kind of, of, of what might actually work. Um, um, and it, but, you know, to understand kind of the positive aspects of a bike lane and really kind of where it could go further, you need to look at the subculture that actually gave us a bike lane, which is bicycle protest movements within particular cities. Um, for example, critical mass, where the bicycle, it's not about riding a bike, it's more about reclaiming space and developing a new language around urban planning. We did work with a uh, a bicycle, um, you know, a sports company that owns bicycles or whatever back in the 2000s. And, you know, the way in which that company had framed their product was as a recreational vehicle, as a rec recreational machine, you could say. And what they were missing is the fact that it was the its use in the future and what its, what its more you know, sort of sort of uh, viable use was was as um, as a mode of transportation. Um, so where do I get that information to understand what are what role is this particular machine going to play in the future? Well, I can go to particular cities where certain subcultures are more prominent around um, uh, sort of speaking out the relationship between uh, these protests and policymaking. One of them happened to be Portland. There were other cities as well, and you start studying the language in those in those you know as a you know as a corpora. You know, you look at it as a you know different uh, uh, corpus of, of 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 texts that give you what becomes the new taxonomy of what urban planning is becoming. It's not about bicycles. It's it's as much it would be about you know we now have things like five minute cities and all these other terminologies that start emerging. The root of this is in a different framework of human beings and their relationship to space. 
You could similarly look at during um, COVID-19, study skateboarders um, in cities and, and how their idea of, re of their ownership of space is actually telling you how, how public spaces actually need to, how, how they actually need to function. Graffiti is another, graffiti artist is, an, is another really uh, great example. One of the, one of the sort of uh, economic trends over the last 20 years that, that people have, some people have paid more attention to others, is that within urban centers, there is a diminishing amount of public space. More and more public space is becoming privatized. And so the idea of what we, our ownership of our space is a very difficult thing to articulate. Pan the pandemic helped us in many ways because you saw a lot of kind of hacking of urban spaces during that particular time. You saw like restaurants with sort of outdoor sheds. It changed our kind of cognitive framework for how these, how these spaces actually um, you know, uh, might function, but to be able to source where that information is going to come from is going to be, is, you know, it's going to be much more valuable. So when we start looking at it in terms of, you know, that relationship in terms of grassroots futures of like what kind of the grassroots subculture is saying the future should be and what the policy future is, you know, it's kind of the difference between, you know, uh, uh, stooping, you know, the idea of stoops in cities where people community talk to each other and they gather information to sort of apply to sort of solve these problems or stumping. And we fight a lot against kind of being told information. And I would say going back to what I said about technology, technology makes it very difficult because we're awash in this technology where we're being kind of told almost what to say. It's sort of like the, the you know, like, you know, Give somebody the opportunity to make a selfie and they make a selfie that looks like the other selfie that came from it. You don't come up with anything new. You're not thinking about what you really need. You're not really thinking about your own needs and identity and the relationship you have to other people within your community. So the, what's happened is, is that we have very hyperbolic kinds of um, cycles going on. This is a picture from sort of anti-CRT uh, you know, groups at, at uh, public uh, you know, school um, hearings. Um, and it has a lot to do with how that technology is really feeding kind of like a, a rage engine that we need to be more aware of if we're actually going to sort of fix certain policy issues, because um, you can't just sort of pretend it isn't there. You have to recognize how it's working. You have to recognize sort of the mechanics of how that's working. So, you know, to put it into the context of a, of a mapping approach, you're really thinking about where, what data that you can source. So sourcing social protest data, thinking about when you're thinking about it, working with food companies and so forth, ingredients and techniques that are emerging. We look at product um, design and packaging, the way in which people sort of are frame, beginning to frame these stories to develop these taxony, taxonomies to be able to map them and measure them and to, and to pattern those and, and, and to pattern those those narratives um, over time. The part about this that I, you know, as I get into some of these other examples is that is to remember what we're not doing when we think about trend analysis is we're not thinking enough about the source of the data. We're not thinking enough about um, am I am I what other data could I bring in this that would that would expand my thinking around what actually is happening? The problem is is that when we typically think about trend research, we I mean for many many years, trend research was basically sentiment analysis. It was looking at kind of, you know, whether people like something or don't like something or whatever. And it was based upon a certain type of person and whatever. We need to be thinking much more of expanding sort of for the diversity of the society that we live in and bringing in those sources of data and being able to analyze them uh, much more, uh, much more carefully. Um, so to put this into them perspective of like the world that we we're living in with all these new tools is that AI is a and these sort of machine learning tools like Midjourney and so forth offer and chat, you know, GPT, everything is, 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 is getting everybody very excited. But they are a study um, in, again, what I was just saying, which is, uh, what are they based on? Um, you know, they are a, you know, they are outputs based upon a finite data source. 
Um, we need to recognize their uh, potential, but we also recognize why they are um, incomplete at this particular um, at this particular moment because we're not. They're very engineering focused. They're very much. Well, they're, they're, the data sets are determined by the engineers who program these particular AI, this particular AI. There's a certain narrative within that. I'll give you as an example, I did a quick test of Dolly when it first um, was offering the ability to upload photos of, of your own and offer um, AI kind of versions, uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of artificial versions of them. And on the left is you know, my daughter, getting her driver's license and taking me for a drive. Um, and, you know, that was a reality. This is us taking a drive. On the right is one picture, but every single image that it would bring back would be, it would flip the, uh, and place a male in the driver's seat. Um, and, you know, sometimes it would make, you know, my seat where I was sitting, sometimes I would be pregnant. I, I don't know, I would be, um, do you, like, I start seeing kind of, there's a limit to uh, this data. There is a certain, um, you know, you start beginning to kind of see the, the walls of the world that you're kind of living in where, um, uh, and when you see that, what's good to see about that is how you sort of break through those walls to be able to expand those particular, um, those particular data sets. To, to think in that way, you know, the problem is, is engineer, an engineering mindset tends to think a lot of the tools that they have, they think in the methods that they have. I would really um, recommend uh, thinking much more in terms like artists do. Um, and this is a wonderful artist by the name of Mel Kendrick. He's a sculptor and he has a lovely uh, quote that says, every sculpture is only a, a point in time. Every object could go further. It's that we tend to think in new. When we think of imagination and we think of something, it's that we are creating something that is new. When we think of, you know, especially in the world of trends, it's like the idea of creating something that is new that hasn't been done. But really what we have to recognize, what we're always doing is that we need to be building on what we have and what we need and the problems and, and particular conditions that we have. We tend to ignore a lot of those kinds of things. So looking at kind of, um, there's actually a, uh, you know, there's a there's a uh, a type of of, of um, fiction, science fiction called mundane science fiction that specializes in this area. Maybe some of you are are familiar with it. Where you know, in mundane science fiction, they don't focus on flying cars and aliens and so forth. They focus on the things that we have and trying to solve um, uh, existing problems with tools in more creative and imaginative in creative and imaginative ways. Um, and so it's a, you know, it, it, it requires much more thinking in the ambiguity of, 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 of things. Um, as I had mentioned before, when we look at a, a phone, you know, we, we, the, the draw towards efficiency of operation is such an allure, right? If we make it easy. I want to make things easier. But you realize an artist would very much think about when I make things easier, I make somebody more passive. And you look at the other kinds of potential issues that are created when you, um, you know, sort of, you know, sort of when you take that particular path. So to put this into sort of a, um, into some narrative context uh, in thinking in terms of mid journey esque kind of uh, uh, frameworks is, you know, how might we imagine you know, participation in food systems. Well, we look at sort of the narrative system of food is really the relationship between food habits and food security. It has a lot to do with, are we looking at what we have, you know, and recognizing the resources that we have? And are we also looking at kind of how much our habits can create waste issues that we can't control anymore, right? So, um, you know, we can create Great tastes for things that we can't continue to eat, right? You know, we um, even in terms of organic farming, one of the sort of the offshoots of organic farming is is certain organic farming methods that were sort of distributed are ones that require a lot of water that we will not have and we end up having less of. It's not reliable, 
sort of over time. And so you're not creating a sustainable system that way when you think that way. So if you look in terms of you know, prompting AI to help in this process of imagination is you think of, well, community kitchens that harvest invasive species along the Manhattan Harbor to prepare as everyday meals. It's that, are we eating that which we would not consider food, but could be food? And you realize what's important here is that, you know, all of those things that are, we would consider inedible today, are quickly contextualized from a subculture standpoint and become edible tomorrow. So when people talk about how I will never eat insects, give I just give you time, is that it's a subculture process. We are as a, you know, culture is, is a biological system. At some point, it becomes something that gives, uh, one, we accept, and two, even gives us social currency. I, I could have had, uh, you know, when I first started teaching at uh, at Parsons, you know, the few male students that I have and I talk about sort of how the in the future we will move much more away from from meat consumption, just because it's just an inevitability that we move away from meat consumption, is that the pushback, it will never happen, it will never happen. Well, 15 years later, you know, they're lined up at the you know impossible burger and you know and and so forth. It's like there's a it all depends, you have to sort of understand that. We are social creatures, and understanding that process um, is is important to sort of uh, sort of get past sort of what we think sometimes is the inevitability of cultural change. Another one would be sort of looking at fashion systems. Um, you know, uh, we are now kind of in a critical kind of overconsumption, oversaturation. Um, what's interesting about um, the pandemic is that it it really uh, made us much more aware of value chains, value systems, and how the inability to travel and so forth has changed how we think about relocalizing, um, how we look at the making and manufacture. Um, so if we were to prompt AI, um, it would be to move away from owning rituals to making rituals. So how, what would we do with it if we had apparel editing machines in our bedroom that were able to convert used clothing into new clothing? You could invent that particular machine, but you need to understand its context and how it's actually going to be accepted is going to be much more of a incremental subculture kind of evolution. Um, there has been an evolution of editing clothes over the last 30 years. Um, different recessions sort of drive certain behaviors that way. We have different engagement in terms of what we accept as a, as a finished fashion product. I would say in the future, um, it would be easy for me to imagine that as a, as a, as a goal is that, is that uh, uh, consumers would actually begin to start buying patterns and not buying finished products. But you have to understand to be able to, to, to consume a pattern of something, you need a lot of other social help to do that. And so what we're trying to do when we think about changing fashion systems, we have to think about investing and cultivating those subculture helps towards helping more of the mass population understand changes in those particular habits, moving away from buying without thinking, which is basically what fast fashion has become. Um, and then I sort of moved to education in my last example, which is, you know, we are now kind of at a critical point of what is the purpose of education? Why do I go to university? Um, is it market skills or is it my, or am I developing human skills? We're, we're more and more, if students are in university right now, they are much more having to consider, are the skills that I'm learning things that a machine could learn just as well? So the things that I learn, how am I, how, where am I in that? And then you start getting a lot of sort of anxieties in this particular process, because a lot of students, there are trends that sort of economic trends that show this, that more and more students are dropping out, they're doing gap years, they're kind of rethinking kind of what is the purpose of that? 
to analyze that current moment is a lot of this. It's this kind of tension. It was much like with privacy within technology. We're seeing this tension that hasn't been completely articulated as a story, but is going to tell you not only what schools are going to be, but it's all also going to tell you what kinds of skill sets that companies need to develop. Because it's not just about school. It's about saying, well, what is a job? What is the, you know, how, how do I continue to do that work? How do I gain any kind of sense of my own identity within that particular process? It's very important. So when we think in terms of like new technologies, I would say, you know, study around the sort of technologies around echoborgs and human hybrids of like using a lot of conversation recently about using these chat GPTs in terms of becoming kind of serenoids, uh, echoborgs of sort where they help you they learn what you know and don't know and help you learn the things that you know that you that you need to know. Um, the purpose of education should not be to tell you things to fit into boxes. It should actually be teaching us how to be more human and actually to take greater risks and be more experimental. We, you know, companies struggle with this is that, you know, we need people who are actually going to help us think about the thing that we haven't thought of already. But it, right now, we're so much caught in residual codes of, of education, it's very difficult to do that. So how do you develop these hybrid models? You need to understand kind of how those narratives are actually um, playing playing out right now. Our, I, would, I would leave you with like that in terms of looking at research this way is that we need to think much more in terms of a lab approach to research. And I say that in that, you know, labs, um, I'll let you get things wrong. Um, it's not about it's not about having a right answer. It's about letting things break and sort of having incomplete answers to things and being able to continue to study that because those are going to be the most valuable um, kinds of uh, sort of uh, sort of insights um, going forward. There's a wonderful quote from Steven Pinker. You know, an essential part of rationality is dealing with randomness in our lives and uncertainty in our knowledge. I mean, that is the state that we're in. And we really need a research framework that can really match that kind of volatility and complexity that we have going forward. And that being said, that is, those are my slides, if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, Tim. Super, super interesting to see the, the concept and then figure out the, the different applications, the different trends, subculture, mainstream culture, subculture identify, gives a, a very good flavoring of it. Um, I'm gonna open up for questions in a second, but so if anyone has any, feel free to uh, to go for it. I'm just gonna take the privilege and ask one that is burning for me. Sorry, Matt, I saw you were about to jump, but I'll pass to you straight after. Uh, but I'm curious, have you applied? I see that a lot of these you have applied to broader context, like let's say the outside of an organization, have you ever applied them internally to the within an organization, the sort of conversations that are happening? Well, it's exactly. I mean, right now, without naming, you know, one particular company, it's about changing R and D within a tech company because it's the idea of within the R and D process, uh, there are certain biases that are stopping, that are almost keeping the the use of certain kinds of how you use your patents and how you use the sort of abilities, the capabilities that you have, expanding it. And thinking about other linkages to it that you might that might not occur to you. So um, we we're current that like that's a particular you know obvious area is like more trying to sort of um, I have nothing. I mean like I'm I had mentioned sort of um, sort of it's somewhat of a negative around kind of the state of of engineering and what it's done to our world. I don't have a negative about engineering at all, but I do think that there needs to be much more of a hybridization of um, within kind of engineering and art because the kinds of problems that we need to solve are more abstract and more ambiguous. And I would say everything is not building something. Sometimes it's not building something. Like I would say, like it's, it's the idea of like, as an engineer to say, I'm not gonna do that is like, is, and it's very difficult in some, you know, because just the way in which certain teams are, are structured is being able to help gain a voice for that and actually articulate it and put it into sort of practice in a more sort of in context in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Matt, over to you. 
Thank you. Yeah, interesting presentation, Tim. Thank you. I'm curious your perspective. If if we respect the last point you made, and and amplified with Pinker about uncertainty, is the implication or could an implication for DAOs be to sort of in the style of Nassim Taleb think about options where you know, given the uncertainty, given how cultures change, and it's hard to know what it might be and what it might mean for the community or the product or service. Is that one of the takeaways from this presentation? Or if not, you know, if, if the tale of paradigm is wrong for you, interpreting your your advice, uh, what would be a better paradigm? Well, I think that, um, I mean, the, it, the, the tale of uh, connection it, it, it is very valid. It's that I think in terms of, because what it is, is that we are always um, expect the unexpected. Uh, you know, is it, it, is that I think, and I had mentioned before, uh, in terms of recessions or any of these particular existing frameworks, we make assumptions. If you watch any financial network and you sort of see people kind of saying how they expect to get over an inflation or what through inflation and all this, and they're and they're basing it on models that are so separated from the human beings that are actually going to decide how that's actually going to, to work. Um, it's, what I would say, though, is, is be clear on expanding the types of, ex, the, the range of externalities that are actually affecting that change. One, it's not just a pure, like when we're working with commercial clients, we're looking at it just as much as like, the CIA or whoever else would be looking at a lot of political sort of changes. And we look at protest movements. We look at kind of the tensions between political speech and protest speech within particular localities. Um, but you connect all those because, again, exactly. What are my options? Because you actually have to make a decision at some point and you have to make you have to say this is my best investment at this point. And this will step and i know that this won't you know we can be too i think that the, it's sort of moving against what's happened with technology sort of pitching over the last say 10 15 years is it's not get, go big or go home these kind of like like break it till you make it or something it's like you have to recognize how much can actually be lost if you do it in that way is that what is your next step how adaptable are you when it doesn't when the model doesn't fit the next time like it's so many assumptions are that the model will stay the same. It's not going to. So I would definitely uh, agree with that. It's just trying to sort of look at those options and think a lot about the adaptability of those options. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, any Anyone else? We are about, almost running out of time, but maybe have uh, time for a last question. And yeah, I'm seeing Mel and an interesting comment about the, the current syntax of organizational differentiation doesn't serve us well. Um, curious your your thoughts about that in terms of then culture and trends. Well, it's interesting because there's a lot of culture has been used a lot in terms of, org, you know, um, you know, there are, you know, many sort of uh sort of initiatives within companies to go and change the culture of those companies as if the culture is inside of the company but the culture is that company with all those people who have relationships to culture outside of that company so you know you have engineering departments and they have relationships to subcultures and so forth and like understanding that you know there are the walls don't exist anywhere you have to see things only in terms of society i would say organizational kinds of issues are the same as looking at categories for, for products. You know, I can look at coffee, but it doesn't live in the coffee world. It lives in a world of where we grow certain things in certain ways. We have certain resources and we manufacture and product and, and it's used ritualistically in a certain way. Similarly, inside companies, it's the same thing. It's the ways and the ways things are done um, and how people, uh, how social cohesion works. You know, it's like, what are you using as sort of a, uh, a a reason to believe in those kind of those networks of social cohesion within companies, I think is really more the issue um, now when, uh, you know, moving away from hierarchical kinds of models. Fascinating. Makes, uh, 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I, I really live with the, the takeaway of the, the framing of culture doesn't live within an organization. Uh, and then seeing how this operates as a network, as a system, as you're talking about, leaves a, a bunch of interesting questions and, and things to continue the conversation. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for coming, team. I don't know if you have been able to see the chat, but there were multiple uh, mentions of gratitude and appreciation. Okay. Um, it was a pleasure to have you, and thank you very much, everyone else, for, for joining and participating in the conversation. Hopefully, see you soon in another one of these, uh, and have an excellent rest of the day, everyone.